It's part three of our interview with Bad Finger photographer Christian Treber. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Music. At the end of this video, we'll announce the two next winners of prints from Christian Treber. But in this next clip, we're going to talk about, well, the boys composing the music, what they were like traveling together. Christian will tell us about Mike Gibbons, their drummer, and his aspirations before he died. And a lot more, but one of the most important things I asked was, where do you think they'd be today if they were all still alive? Remember, three of the four are dead. Our conversation with Christian Treber. How were the guys in Badfinger when it came to you being there all the time? You, didn't you just kind of become another comrade of the band? I mean... I became like a, like in a way, I guess you could say, a fifth member. I mean, wherever they went, I went. I went to, I insisted on paying my own way. That was one thing, though, because of the fact that I didn't think it was right for me to go and, even though they were making a lot of money, I still or thought they were making a lot of money. Yeah. I didn't think it would be right for me to sponge off them. So I insisted on paying my own way. I rode on the bus with them. All the meals I paid for myself. The nights we stayed at a hotel, I paid for myself and so forth. That was one of the conditions I made. You know, when they weren't on stage, we were goofing around in the bus, and they were composing songs, or we were singing songs together, old stuff like Poison Ivy and that kind of stuff, all the classic hits. And it was just, just a very, very close camaraderie. And then Bill was part of it. It was just like a big family. Mm -hmm. Like Bill was the father, and then the band member were my little brothers. Mm -hmm. And they even had a guy that snuck on the, on the bus and that photograph I sent you with uh, the guys pushing the bus, you'll see Joey's hands are on the guy's butt for whatever reason. That was Simon. They found him amongst the luggage in the back of the bus. He buried himself under the stuff, got on the bus, buried himself on it. And when he discovered it, instead of throwing him off, they asked him if he wanted to become a roadie. I don't know if he got paid or not, but they allowed him to stay with the group and supposedly work as a roadie. He really didn't do a heck of a lot of work. He was more interested in picking up girls and bathing in the spotlight. How big were the venues when you were with them? Who were they playing to? How, how many people? Mostly colleges, some small clubs. And good reception from where, everywhere they went? Oh, yeah. Very, very, very good. One of the clubs, I'll forget. I mean, one of the, uh, the colleges, I'll never forget either. Come to it just hit me. <laughs> they were playing. And all of a sudden, the doors in the back of the room opened up, and a bunch of guys on motorcycle jackets, I don't know if they were Hells Angels or what it was, rode down the, the uh, aisle to the front of the stage and then took their chains and kept on hitting the stage saying, boogie, 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 boogie. And then band to band finger broke into a boogie. What the heck? <laughs> Jeez. That's like a movie, right? That's like a part of a movie. Yeah. I just thought it was funny. I just thought it was hysterical. I asked Pete if he was scared. He says, no, no, no. I wasn't scared. He says, I, he said, they just wanted to have some fun. Well, and I said, well, you sure that was all it was? Yeah. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, there were probably some guys hung around the, co the college and basically knew that there was a concert here tonight, maybe even liked our music, and they just decided to join in. Who was the, uh, the quietest guy in the band? Pete. Yeah. Mike and I talked a lot. Tommy and I, when he was sober, talked a lot. Pete was always off by himself, mostly. I mean, we spent time together, but still, most times, he was always jotting down notes and writing other songs. I mean, that was his life. Yeah, That's all he did. He had pads and pads and pads of notes for different songs and different chord progressions and, and different lyrics and all this kind of stuff. He was doing it all the time, 24-7, practically. Did you ever see Pete and Tommy like talk to each other about about songs or? I did see them when I was in London the first trip. Uh, I'm trying to think it was before or after Brussels when they were recording No Dice. Uh, we I went to their rehearsal studio. It was a very very small room somewhere in, in, in London, and I went and we was working with them and so forth like that. And I got where I saw them working on the different songs and that. I wanted to take photographs there too, but unfortunately, it was so darn dark and dank looking. It was very difficult to do it. I didn't want. Obviously, I didn't use a flash. That's the thing people don't understand either. Back then, everything was available. Like you just work with what you had. Is there anything else you want to share with me uh, uh, about the the Bad Finger Boys? Well, yeah, they, I, they were on, or suppose they were on a, doing a radio station interview with Jim Kerr on WPLJ in New York, and that night they were supposed to be playing at Ungano's. 
yet it wasn't mentioned at all. In the whole conversation, not once did they mention they were playing at Engano's. And so I called in on the air, and uh, I said to Jim Kerr, I said, I'm Bad Fingers photographer. And he says, oh, they're here with me. I said, yeah, I know. I said, I guess they forgot to mention that they're playing at Engano's, and I gave the whole spiel of where they were playing that night, what time, and so forth. And, of course, that's the night that George Harrison showed up and introduced the band. He and Patty showed up. Wow. Do you ever get a chance to talk to George? Yeah, yeah, not much. He, again, was very quiet. Very, very, very quiet. It was a very, very strange thing, because one of the times I was in the studio with Badfinger and they're working on, I think it was, I think it was definitely No Dice. But whatever, Ringo and him showed up, and they were just sitting there. And Mike was sitting there because he wasn't playing drums. He wasn't doing his part. And Ringo kept on looking at Mike. And Mike kept on looking at Ringo. And he just kept on going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So I walked up to Ringo and said, hey, why don't you go over and talk to him? He obviously wants to talk to you. And so he did. He went over and sat down next to Mike and they, you know, talked. That, well, it's pretty intimidating when you think about it. <laughs> Yeah, I, to me, I would just, as I said, when we talked, we never talked about music. We talked about everything other than that. We talked about solitaire. We talked, I mean, I'm not solitaire. We talked about politics. We talked about soccer. We talked about their families. You name it, we talked about it. Everything, the news, et cetera, how certain dates were, you know, all this kind of stuff. As, as you know, I used to tape a lot of the concerts, and sometimes we go and play the concerts back on the tape in the bus while we were riding along. And they would listen to it, and we'd criticize it and talk about different things they could have done to make it better. Like on uh, Suitcase, I suggested Pete using a Wawa on it, adding a Wawa to it. And they tried it out at the rehearsal, like what it did, and then, then it stayed that way. Where do you think they would have gone if, they, uh, if, if uh, Tommy and uh, Pete were still alive, specifically them two? I think, as I said again, I, th- I, I think Timeless is, in a, is a perfect... Dr- example of where they were going. They were becoming much, much more sophisticated, not only in their writing, but also their instrumentation. Things were getting more and more complicated. The difference between them and the Beatles were, or was, is that the Beatles got to a point where they felt they couldn't produce the sound live. With Badfinger, they would have found a way. As a matter of fact, with Timeless, if you listen to the album version of the song, which is on the Ass album, and then you listen to the live version on YouTube, they're virtually identical. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's absolutely amazing that they were able to reproduce that sound with the guitar and all the rest of that stuff live as well. Entirely different bands you probably know in the studio as opposed to live. Live, they were a raucous band. They just went out there and played rock and roll, which is what they love. What was, uh, what was Mike Gibbons like? Very much like Pete, very quiet, very down to earth. Uh, the time I spent with him in Florida, I don't think was typical Mike because of the fact that I think he knew about the brain aneurysm. We had a lot of fun together, but I noticed he was smoking an awful lot and he was also drinking an awful lot. I mean, yeah, he had a brain aneurysm and I think that might have been the cause of it. They knew he was going to die, so he was just drinking a lot more and smoking a lot more. Never got drunk so he couldn't understand him or that he couldn't get around driving and so forth, but I think he... And I know, actually, that he wanted to become more than just Bad Fingers drummer. Mm-hmm. And that he had done a lot of recording, he had a lot of albums, and we had actually worked on compiling the best songs that he felt of all the uh, albums that he recorded and basically releasing it as a double CD. And I had put it together for it, sent it to him, talked to him on the phone, and at that time I think his wife was separated from him for, for some reason. But whatever... I sent it to him, and he said, no, 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 this is all wrong. I don't like it. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'll remix all the stuff. I'll go and I'll put it in the order I want and just release it as that. But then, unfortunately, he died, and then his wife didn't feel that that was really the case. She said that, no, he never wanted to be released. He was just being nice to you and friendly to you, and that this can't be released. There you have it. We may have another part of this one. I, I have about 15 minutes left, which I haven't gone into. I haven't had the time. We're doing so many interviews that we may add a fourth part to this. We'll let you know the next few days. The 
Contest winners of the next two prints, remember the deal is you get to pick what print you wanted. Uh, Gabby Gilbert or Gilbert, I'm not sure, and Michael Menriquez. Gabby's from our Facebook, Michael's from YouTube. We'll let you both know we're going to respond to your applications. Christian will send you an autographed print of your choice. Love talking to Christian Treber. He's a fun guy. Great stories, huh? Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. I'm John Bowden from Rocky Street Music. Mm -hmm.